While I was walking to my car on a snowy November evening, I absentmindedly checked my blue sky timeline. I'm not paying full attention, rather I'm thinking about what dinner will be, but I hit a specific post by John Green, a writer I admire. Hank Green is so ambitious, it's exhausting. My life is like being the co-author of the Federalist Papers. I'm all like, John Jay got sick after writing five, and Hank's like, Hamilton wrote the other 51. By the way, that voice was by Ofidoki here on YouTube. Her channel will be in the description. When I see this post, I don't think about how politically messy Hamilton is. How I like the musical, but I have so many issues with the premise. Not even how the post itself is fairly harmless. I do something wholly unproductive. I cringe. My cringe wasn't about Hamilton being problematic. It felt more like secondhand embarrassment, like seeing something overly earnest in a space where irony reigns supreme. I think of myself as fairly kind. I don't like to mock people online or be unnecessarily mean. I don't think the post itself is even that bad. But when I saw this, it was like I just smelled rotten food. That honestly made me pause. I have genuine criticisms of Hamilton, but I don't think that gut reaction was directly about the play's several misdeeds. This moment got me thinking. Why do we sometimes mistake a gut reaction like cringe for meaningful critique? And what does that mean for how we interact with art and fandoms online? Hamilton's success is undeniable, but its flaws, both in historical framing and how fandom responded, reveal something deeper about how we process and critique media. Let's dissect how cringe culture interacts with actual criticism through the lens of Hamilton fandom. Hi, I'm Sunny Dionysus. I'm an artist, a video essayist, and most of all, an annoyance. I'm fascinated by our digital age and I need to yap about it somewhere people may listen. If that sounds appealing, make sure to subscribe and like the video. So, why did Hamilton resonate so deeply? To understand how cringe, criticism, and fandom collide, we first have to unpack what made it such a phenomena. Hamilton is a cultural juggernaut, chronicling the life of its titular character through rivalries, scandals, and revolution, all set to a genre-blending soundtrack. I'm going to be very positive in this section about the musical because I need you to understand why it was so popular. However, please watch until the end for my complete thoughts on it all. I have to admit that I love to watch the official cut online. How can I not? While Lin-Manuel Miranda, the creator and the actor playing Hamilton, is probably the weakest part of the cast, the other characters in the Broadway released are doing some of the best work I've seen in a play. The lyrics themselves are very intricate, with Hamilton dying when he finally threw away his shot. The dramatic irony is heightened by the themes present in the music. A standout in my mind is Leslie Odom Jr., the actor who plays Aaron Burr. He threads the needle between having an incredible, imposing presence and yet a sophistication that no one can deny. It's almost embarrassing to watch Lin-Manuel Miranda get overshadowed by Odom in his own production. In an interview with Anscape Media, Odom talks about his auditioning experience for the role of Burr. In that first time watching it, um, sure, there were moments like my shot and the opening and satisfied that just completely bowled me over. But the, but the image that, that, made me a Hamill fan for life. Like I didn't know I was, I wasn't sitting in that last row thinking I was gonna be in the show, but the image in the story of tonight, I had never in my life seen four men of color on stage singing about friendship and brotherhood in my life. And to me, the image of that was the revolution. He was showing us something new. I had chills thinking about it. To be frank, this video makes it hard for me to dislike Hamilton. Odom speaks so passionately about representation and his pride in the musical. I will of course be critical of the show, but if you, like Odom, saw yourself in these characters, don't let anyone take that away from you. Its awe-inspiring soundtrack and intricate lyrics made it irresistible to millions, including me. But it wasn't just the music. It was the way Hamilton rebranded America's founding mythology for a new generation. 
And that's part of why its reception has been so divisive. As Annette Gordon-Reed says in her criticism, Hamilton, the musical Blacks and the Founding Fathers, Indeed, it has played to near universal acclaim from points all along the political spectrum. How could this be? How could a work that so unabashedly celebrates the Founding Fathers and has no storyline for Black characters not take some hits from academic historians who have spent the past several decades arguing against unrealistically heroic portrayals of the Founders and arguing for including people of color in the story of America's creation? What, in this age of concerns about inequality and big banks, are we doing going gaga over a play about a man who promoted both? In other words, Hamilton's celebration of the Founding Fathers risks reinforcing problematic narratives, sidelining the very people it claims to uplift. This critique highlights Hamilton's Paradox, a show that celebrates diversity in its casting while centering its narrative around white historical figures. While the actors of color bring energy and representation to the stage, the story still primarily uplifts wealthy white men, leaving little room for the voices of enslaved people or marginalized groups who were equally, if not more, central to America's creation. One of the most glaring critiques is how Hamilton erases or minimizes the role of slavery in its story. While slavery is mentioned briefly in songs like Cabinet Battle No. 1, it's treated more as a backdrop than as a defining part of America's founding. Characters like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, who owned slaves, are portrayed in ways that gloss over this fundamental contradiction. Washington is cast as a wise, fatherly figure, and Jefferson becomes a charismatic, if antagonistic, force. The musical sidesteps the deep moral and political implications of their actions, focusing instead on their achievements. The founders are painted as flawed yet relatable, visionary yet human, but the systemic inequalities they upheld are largely absent from the narrative. This isn't just a missed opportunity, it's a historical distortion. At its core, Hamilton presents a story of ambition, genius, and resilience. But for some, its portrayal of Alexander Hamilton as a progressive outsider feels deeply misplaced. Hamilton, in reality, was a staunch federalist who championed big banks and centralized power, policies that disproportionately harmed the poor and entrenched inequality. Critics argue that by romanticizing Hamilton's ideals, the musical risks glossing over their impact, particularly on marginalized communities. Additionally, Hamilton's timing played a role in how it was received. Premiering during the Obama presidency, it resonated with themes of hope, change, and progress, aligning with the political optimism of the time. But viewed through a post-2016 lens, its celebration of the Founding Fathers feels more fraught in an era of renewed scrutiny over systemic racism and the legacy of slavery, Hamilton's omissions and romanticism stand out more sharply. While academic critiques provide depth, there's another layer to consider. The evolution of Hamilton cringe. I'm going to put up a rule before this section of not posting anyone else's artwork. This is because one, these artists were most likely children who did not know the consequences of posting online. And two, I make it a point to never bash other people's artwork, and not for any tangible reason, I just don't think it's cool. It's been done to me, and I really don't want to perpetuate bullying. So, to illustrate this section, I'll be creating my own 2024 Hamilton fan art. Because, really, there's no better way to do it ethically. As preliminary research, I looked up Hamilton Cringe on Google. Great starting point, I know. I scrolled a bit and found some Pinterest posts that had some relationship art. Unfortunately, I had the same reaction to this as I did with John Green's post. At this point, I was trying to look past that feeling. I asked myself how I felt back in 2015 about these pieces. Honestly, I loved Hamilton. It came out when I was freshly 13, and I'd never been a part of any community like that before. There was a type of sincerity to it all. Not to sound elitist, but back then, 
it was so much easier to be sincere online. Online spaces have never really been kid-friendly or even safe, but it felt like that when I was engaging with Hamilton on Tumblr. I realize now that the reason I cringed at John Green's post was not productive, because it did not center on the politics of Hamilton, rather it centered on my own nostalgic embarrassment. Hamilton is a complex play that warrants thought-provoking discussion. The initial cringe I felt from seeing John's tweet was unproductive, but the following video and charity drive is not. Wincing at some posts isn't necessarily bad, but that first reaction shouldn't be the end of it. By engaging with these critiques, we don't have to dismiss Hamilton entirely. Instead, we can appreciate its artistry and impact while questioning what stories we prioritize and how we choose to tell them. It's a chance to hold our media accountable, not just for what it includes, but for what it leaves out. I want to introduce y'all to my fundraising stream. The Black Girls Film Camp is an amazing nonprofit that works to bring resources and attention to young female Black filmmakers. I'm aiming to raise $100 from now till November 20th, when I do an art stream drawing all the requests from the donors. The organization really helps these kids, and I am so proud to say we've already had $10 donated.